Just because Windows up to date and also you have an antivirus does not make you secure on Windows. We need to demystify some of this stuff and actually show you how people hack and get into Windows boxes in this video and also kind of how to harden a lot of Windows. Now you can't ever get there a whole hundred percent so I'm going to show you all the workarounds to the hardening tools that we do today but also say hey these are why they exist and you have a better understanding of security and Windows. Now first up here is Print Nightmare. We need to talk a little bit about this. It is how a remote execution exploit happens and it's basically exploiting the print spooler now there's not much you can do about that running any kind of tool this requires patching but microsoft released about three patches or four patches before it actually got the problem resolved we think as of the recording of this video today they finally released the last patch last patch that we know of that should fix this particular particular exploit and why remote execution exploits are the absolute worst. I really don't pay attention to too many other exploits, but these are the worst because it means people can run executable programs and specifically, I'm more worried about ransomware with this type of thing. So with that, let's move on to what I use to harden a Windows install. Now, first up, is hardening tools. It's a completely open source, peer reviewed. It's been out for many years. The last update was actually in 2020, but this still works in Windows 11 because Windows 11 is really uh, a reskinned version of Windows 10 for the most part. Now, the big things it patches are things that I use as a system admin. So there are things in here that are affected by these, this tool. So I wanna just lay those out real quick. First off, script host. Windows script host I've used to do modifications, severe modifications too. Uh, specifically, I had to migrate 5,000 mailboxes from one mailbox in Outlook to another mailbox, but I didn't want all my users to re-download it and just basically crash the internet. I used a script host or a VPS or VBS file to completely change that. So that's a good application in business, but for home users, Oh, there's not really any application now leaving this enabled. So always, always disable Windows script host office packages. Now this for a home user is a little bit different. Some third party plugins rely on ActiveX or macros, and it just depends on what you're doing with your office. If you have zero add-ins to office, check these, disable your office plugins or this capability of macros and ActiveX because a lot of viruses come through here. And then we have Adobe, Adobe Reader. Honestly, Java could be lumped into here. If you're still got Java, you probably shouldn't be using it. I hate Java, there's so many exploits, but Reader is just as egregious. And Adobe Reader has specific things in it. Uh, probably the most common one I've seen several times a year is just people doing phishing attacks and saying, hey, here's a PDF file. You open it up and it says, click here for a login to this secure document. You click it and then it says, enter your Microsoft or Google credentials and then they steal your credentials. That's probably one of the biggest things I see out of Adobe Reader. So honestly, I would recommend enabling all this as well if you do use Adobe Reader. And then lastly, some of the things I'm gonna just kind of lump all this in. These are mainly used for scripting and that type of thing, specifically PowerShell I use to administer many systems. And also it's how I use my deep bloat and kind of to do some system modifications that I enjoy in Windows. Uh, so I would recommend actually disabling this. This will make my script not run. So once you enable this and you type PowerShell, for instance, it's just gonna say you can't run PowerShell. And that's a good thing, but we need to get around to the workarounds. Now to run this tool, I'm just gonna run it real quick for you. We'll just go to downloads after downloading it, hardening tools.exe, you'll wanna run it as admin. And on startup here, you can see we can restore or we can just change things like this. So if there is something in here you don't like, just hit restore, do your business, and then probably harden it back after you finish. This is a good way to disable PowerShell, auto run, all these things that can cause massive issues with your system. It's just a good thing I like to do in pretty much every system, but there's workarounds to it, specifically Windows 11 and Windows 10 users that have terminal, Windows terminal and the Microsoft Store, which is a huge exploit. If I was wanting to engineer ransomware and go full Walter White and start ransoming off people's computers, I would really engineer a lot of things to go through and utilize that Microsoft Store. Specifically, when you see how PowerShell was disabled, running 
Windows Terminal as admin. Just bypassed it. We're in PowerShell right here, and I'll just run my deep load script as a test. Just come down here, copy my little one-click string, come back into our terminal, paste it in, and you can see now we can do a lot of different things. Now, obviously, this has been peer-reviewed. A lot of people look at this code. It's all open source. But just know that, yeah, I can disable Action Center. I can disable a lot of things in here. And honestly, if I wanted, I could disable Defender and make your system very unsecure. I actually removed a lot of the security options because I was more concerned with people not knowing what they're doing and making themselves unsecure. That's why I no longer allow disabling Defender. And I was getting a lot of false flags from antivirus, which I'm going to get to here in a second. This is just a really interesting way of bypassing it, but it's not the only way to bypass. Another good way to bypass security, or let's say I wanted to install something on someone's machine, is to modify startup. There's two types of startups that you can actually modify through the shell. You can go shell, common startup. This is all users that log into this machine. It'll run whatever I put in here, and then on reboot, it'll run... Uh, if it's a VPS script, if it's anything else, it'll run that stuff. So be cognizant of this as this is all the users in the system. But if we come back into running, we go shell, just plain startup this time, not common startup. This is the actual user startup. If I want to log in as my user, it's going to run these two programs and anything else in here. Check these out periodically. And if there's something in there you don't know what it is, right click, go to properties, and just kind of look, what is this file? And if you're not sure what it is, drag it out of here. And then that specific thing won't start up when your next time your computer does. And if you see no ramifications for it, well, just leave it off. Why, why, why bloat up your system? And then the next thing where people bypass a lot of things when it comes to Windows, task scheduler. Look at your task scheduler and just be real cognizant of what all is being run on your system. These are being run on a regular basis. And be careful, a lot of people will actually bury certain things in like Windows. If I was going to write ransomware or something like that, I would probably bury it into something like in the Microsoft shell and then drop all these tasks in here. All these tasks run on a regular basis and you can set up triggers to go ahead and launch these when you, you launch your browser. I mean, that's how egregious they can be. So be very careful with task scheduler and, and things get, get dropped in here. Uh, obviously, just browse it and uh, look through at the very least, the very start here and see what all's running. Now there is a case to be made to not use antivirus. And I still recommend everyone use antivirus. I actually recommend ESET down in the description, but I at least wanna make people cognizant of this and why sometimes my recommendations change depending on the company, because certain antivirus companies have been found with their hand in the cookie jar, stealing your information and selling it. And also the very first antivirus was actually the first virus creator. It's a engineered business where people that made the original virus profited from it because they were able to sell you the first antivirus. Now, obviously I don't think that's going on very much these days, but it's important to know that a lot of these business models are real shady, specifically the free antivirus. And to kind of show that, here's a little quick Avast AVG. They got really uh, a huge scandal about stealing users information well information about the user i should say not necessarily information on their data but they were gathering a suspicious amount of user data and it, there's a lot of really shady things with free antivirus and i highly recommend you not use free antivirus as if we look back here you can see performance is a major factor you can see massive performance losses in some instances, you lose more performance by using a custom antivirus than not. That's why I'm always trying to refine my recommendations. I remember before I recommended ESET, I recommended Webroot because it was so minimal and it didn't use practically any uh, system resources and it wasn't very heavy, which was fantastic. But it's just really good. I, I, I'll maybe do a separate video going over antivirus completely. This is mostly a false sense of security. and. When it comes to hacking people, I will totally not use any of these regular methods most hackers would use or uh, most people would use through a virus or through exploiting an unpatched registry entry or something like that. It, it's These things, uh, there's ways around it when it comes to Windows. And if you're really, really concerned about security and privacy, obviously uh, Windows is probably not what you should be using. I would obviously recommend Linux or even Mac would have a far leg up on it. 
But with all that said, let me know your thoughts down in the comment section, and I'll see you in the next one.